This is the Misdirected Mark Podcast, a podcast about gaming, game mastering, and entertaining you, our listeners. We are explicit, so you have been warned, and I'd like to thank Mike Willer for letting us use his music on our show. Now let's pick up those mics and get on with this thing. Ooh. All right, we've got our characters ready. Let's start this thing. Great. I can't wait to uh, see how you guys interact with the exploration rules. Uh, exploration rules? Were they different from everything else? Uh, yeah, like a whole chapter on them. Crap, I left my book at home. Yeah, no worries, no worries. I made a few cheat sheets with all the basic rules on them. Uh, did you have one for all the mutant powers? Uh, no, no, no. There's like way too many mutant powers. Um, there wasn't. Isn't there like some space on the character sheet for like you to like jot down some details about your powers? Uh, I'm not sure. I just wrote down the stats and names during the session zero. I thought we'd just look them up during the game. Yeah, that's a good idea. Can I borrow a pencil? Yeah, yep, yep. All right, cool. Let's uh, let's get this game started. Um, all right, you all begin in the ruins of Buffalo. With that, we're going to welcome you to the 459th episode of the Mr. Mark podcast. Tonight, we're going to discuss, discuss session one in your tabletop role-playing games. And along the way, we'll take your comments, examples, and suggestions live from the Chat Room for Life on Twitch before we jump into the after show. But first, my name is Jerry. My name is Phil. And I am Old Man Logan. Welcome back to the show. It feels like it's been a while, and it kind of has. <laughs> Holiday hiatus and all that. But we are back, and let's do our little temperature check thing, see how everybody's doing. Phil, how you doing? How you feeling? Uh, yeah, well, um, I managed not to get, uh, Omicron, so, um, I guess odds are in my favor, best way to put it. Um, doing my best to try not to get it, so healthy now, and, uh, yeah, I don't know, doing all right, I'm feeling okay. How about, uh, about you, Jer? Feeling pretty good, um, back from my trip to New York City where everybody was super good about masks and everything. And uh, just kind of relaxing and enjoying the, uh, a, a slow week at work. Bob? Ah, uh, not too bad. Not too bad over here. Uh, physically, I'm, uh, uh, you know, every once in a while dealing with uh, neck and shoulders. A um, little, little bit cranky right now, but otherwise feeling pretty good. Uh, mentally, feeling a, like a little bit up from a solid meh. So, you know, like. Better than 50-50, so, you know, that's good. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, ready to do this thing, because it's been a while. I had to remember how to put all the gear together, so. <laughs> but we're here, and we're ready to do it, so let's jump into our one thing. And my one thing uh, that has really kind of kept me going, um, especially <laughs> After the beginning of the lockdown, the beginning of the of the pandemic, when we really shouldn't have gone out to see people and we were all locked up in our homes and, and only saw our friends over Zoom. Um, it's so nice to have people be able to come over to my place and hang out with me face to face in person and just, you know, be there together. Um, so I'm really enjoying having friends over Um Especially for the the number of years that uh, when I was in my house that I didn't have friends over for various reasons, mostly because of dogs that didn't like people. <laughs> but yeah, having friends over has been uh, just a pleasure. So, Jerry, what about you? Um, I'm gonna kind of tie into that. Um, this weekend, you hosted friends at your house, and. You hosted the very first uh, lacrosse game I got to watch. We watched some Buffalo Bandits lacrosse, and uh, five of us were there at your place eating snacks and pizza and watching um, a game that I'd never seen before. And I got to say, I really like it. Um, it was fast-paced. It was fun. There was a lot of neat little things interacting. Um, it was neat to have Chris there with us because he'd never seen lacrosse either. But as soon as you explained to him the rules, he started seeing all the tactics and how things fit together and mm -hmm. um, how the, how everything designed worked and why certain rules made the game work better. And so and it was a lot of fun. Um, and, uh, and of course, you and Phil knew all about lacrosse. You were able to fill me in on what the strategies and everything. So it's just a lot of fun. I enjoy watching any uh, sports with people who 
are excited about the sport and can explain to me what's going on and explain to me why it's fun. You know, not just, well, okay, now he's going to score a goal, but it's really cool because he's going to do this or you watch this or this is going to be a neat thing to see. So it was just a lot of fun. Um, plus, Buffalo trounced Toronto, what, 12 to 5 or something like that? Yeah, 12 to 6. Um, yep. Yeah, and uh, and uh, the, the, the fights at the end got so bad that the refs just let the clock run down during the fights instead of stopping for penalties. So it was fun all the way around. I enjoyed it. Phil? Yeah, it was a good time. Um, yeah, I hadn't I hadn't seen a Bandits game since 2019. Um, I don't think I watched any, maybe watched one during the pandemic. I'm not even sure if they had them. Um, but 2019 was the last time, or no, maybe it was January 2020. I took my daughter for her birthday um, to a Bandits game. So it might have been just before the outbreak. Uh, my one thing this week is uh, No Man's Sky. Um, not a new game by any stretch of the imagination, but I finally went out and bought it um, over the Christmas break. Bought it for my PS4. And uh, yeah, I've been having a good time on it. I've been uh, playing it for, I don't know, I think I have like 13 or 14 hours logged on it, um, according to the uh, according to the save game. Um, but yeah, I, I live on a... a I live on a mostly radioactive, toxic planet <laughs> and uh, occasionally leave to do stuff, uh, although mostly uh, have been just um, gathering up resources and finding buried technologies and things like that. But I did get uh, I did get some cool stuff recently. Um, for it so that was that's been good i've been enjoying it it's um if you haven't played it it's a lot like minecraft but with much better graphics um it's pretty chill um as in not a lot of combat um not really any if you're careful i i think at some point there's some unavoidable combat but um, yes there is (laughs) you you need uh what you call it you need to make a weapon in order to uh you know you don't default with one so um I only just made a weapon uh, the other day. We can talk about that later. But anyway, I'm enjoying it. Um, I'm probably going to go play it again right after the show. I was playing it just before the show and then like took a break. So, um, yeah, let's get the show going so I can get back to uh, playing some No Man's Sky. All right. <laughs> that All right. being said, let's get Phil ready to do his favorite bumper. And Go. Workshop, workshop, it's session one. The first time you are playing your game. Is it going to be good? Is it going to be a failure? Will everybody like it? Is this game going to even exist? We're going to show you how to make the best session one here in the workshop. And don't suck. All right. Well, basically, um, we've talked many, many times in the show about session zero. We've even had a whole episode about session zero, which is the session where you set our expectations and the foundation for your campaign. Often you create the characters and everything, but we haven't spent a lot of time talking about what happens after session zero. So tonight, we're going to take a look at session one. We're going to talk about what makes a good session one, what are some pitfalls to avoid, and basically how session one bridges session zero into the rest of your campaign. All right, and in order to get all that done, the first thing we do is get some definitions. So let me prime Phil with this. Behold, you are in the presence Definition Panda. Right, we got to start off um, with the very topic itself as our first definition, and I think our only definition for tonight, session one. Uh, session one is the first session where players take control of their characters and engage with the story. Um, there's a few things going on in session one. We're actually going to unpack this even further um, as, we, uh, as we get into this segment. Um, but some things to note, right? This is the first time the players inhabit their characters. Um, In session zero, they've created their characters. They may have made backgrounds for them, um, but they haven't really actually been their characters yet. So this is really like the first time they're getting to be their characters. Uh, This is the first time the GM is facilitating the game for everyone and the first story of, of whatever campaign you're playing. Depending on your game, um, this could be the first time you are like you're learning the rules. Um, so, like if you're playing something that no one in the group's ever played before, and this is your session one, this is the first time that you are um, engaging with the rules. Now, 
if you've um if some of you have played the game before or if this is a session one for a system you already know this may not be as big of a deal or it might not be um real like for instance if we were going to go and play um you know another tales from the loop game uh for bob and i like we've already engaged with those roles right so it wouldn't be our first time playing it would be um and i think jerry's played like before a uh, con or something so it might not be as big of a deal but if you're playing something new which is um what i tend to do a lot is run newer like run games that i haven't played before um often session one is where you're engaged in the rules for the first time um also, if you haven't played the game in a long time, it can sometimes be like you're playing it for the first time. If I was to go back and play Face Rip now, um, I suspect I remember, you know, a couple of the rules, not all of the rules. So I would be relearning that. Yep. Um, this is also session one is when the game stops being conceptual and um, starts being discernible, meaning that before session one, the world's in stasis, right? You've you've described the history of it. You've described what the situation's going to be when the game starts, but like nothing's happening in the game world. It's just frozen until you reach session one. And then session one is the first time that the game world comes alive. It can um, be changed. It can be interacted with those kinds of things. Uh, your session one might be a complete story if you're super efficient, right? Story being uh, something with a start, middle, and end. Um, or it might just be the first installment of a story. Uh, we typically use session one to denote the start of a campaign. But a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about tonight also applies to one-shots because one-shots are, in a way, their own session ones. They're also the last session, too, which... Um, maybe as a, a topic for a future show to talk about session N, right? The N or X, I don't know, the last session of your campaign. Um, a one shot is actually all of those. And sometimes a touch of session zero um, in there as well, right? So that's, you know, and this is why, you know, Senda and I did, I think, um, what is it, two and a half years, three years of talking about the difference between one shots and campaigns. Um, the one shot is a microcosm of all this stuff. So if some of this advice seems familiar because we've talked about it for one shots, that's probably why. Anyway, all right. there's your definitions. Cool. So now that we're all on the same page with what session one is, Jerry, can we talk about all the things that session one does in a game? All right. Um, basically, as sessions go, session one is going to be extremely busy. There's a lot going on. Um, and this makes it actually one of the more difficult sessions in your campaign to run. So with that in mind, let's list some of the things that you're likely to be managing in session one. This is by no means a complete list, but it's a list of most of the things you're going to encounter. Yeah, first thing, um, and you got to introduce characters, right? In session zero, you may have introduced each other to your characters, but this is like the first time that they go be from they go from being abstract concepts to actual imaginary characters, right? In session zero, Bob may have described his character to me. Bob may have said, this is what he looks like. This is his history. But in session one is the first time Bob's character talks to me. Um, so in terms of session one, each player needs some spotlight time to get a feel for who their character is, some time to work on, you know, trying out their voice for them, cadence, those kinds of things, especially if you are big into voices and accents and stuff. Um, I'm more of a cadence guy, less of an accent guy, but, um, but you, you, you are starting to develop your characteristics for that character. Um, you also in that session one are getting your first taste of what, um, your character actually can do, right? This is the first time you're engaging the rules with your character. So what does your, uh, blaster, like, what does it what does it feel like mechanically in the game when you you know when you shoot it? Like, does it drop the stormtrooper instantly? Does it only like you know wound the stormtrooper? Like, these are like the things that you're starting to get a feel for the first like in session one. All right, the next thing that's going to happen is you just start establishing the group roles and the group dynamics. This is going to be the first time the players have worked with their characters as a group. The first time each of the characters is going to interact, interact with each other. Um, while the characters' backgrounds are going to define the existing group, 
this is the first time they're actually performing as a group. You may all know that you're all um, various spies that are now on the run, but session one is the first time when you actually come together and have to work together and see how you interact and establish your personalities and relationships. Um, this is going to see when they start to develop their roles in the group and see who's got what niches um, and see where, where various abilities overlap. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also session one, you're introing the world. Uh, depending on the game you're playing, you may need to introduce the world to the players, right? This is going to vary a lot by game. Um, it's going to vary a lot by game and it's going to vary a lot by experience, right? So if yep. we're all... Um, if we're all experienced D and D players and we're going to play in forgotten realms, we don't really have to introduce that much of the world. Uh, likewise, we're playing Knights Black Agents. We're playing in, you know, a quote modern world. I don't really have to explain, um, how trains and planes and cell phones and stuff like that work. Uh, but if we're playing, uh, for instance, we're going to play our, um, Cortex Prime game, Ox, um, in another couple of weeks, nothing about that world. Um, is established. We're going to be literally making it up as we go. Um, so we'll be doing a lot of intro to the world. So if the world's new, the GM's got to like, like needs to explain to the players the elements in it. Um, this is also true if you're playing homebrews, right? If you make your own homebrew world, um, you got to like explain conventions and architecture and things like that. Um, so the players have some idea of what the world's like and also like what are appropriate actions that they can take within the world. That's really important. And sometimes character, you, you don't react the same to every universe as you would, uh, <laughs> ours. Exactly. Um, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to talk teaching the rules, uh, depending on the game you're playing, this may be the first time the players are learning the game or learning the rules. Um, and often the teaching of the game follows the GM as being the person who have read the rules while getting the game prepared. Uh, but the players also need to be aware of the rules, and this may be the first time they're all interacting with them. The GM's going to need to set aside time to teach various core mechanics, such as skill checks and combat. The first time people are going to have to reach for those dice, it's going to take longer to do that, and there's going to be questions that need to be uh, answered and resolved during that uh, first uh, session zero, or session yep. one. Session one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next thing that happens during se session one is engaging the primary core loop of the game. That's a mouthful. Um, as a quick reminder, the core loop of the game is the activities that are central to the game, right? Some games, this is very um, noticeable, right? So like in Blades in the Dark and other Forged in the Dark games, there is a built-in core loop, right? Where there's like some open play. Then in Blades in the Dark, there's the score. And then there's downtime, right? And if you've played Scum and Villainy, if you've played Band of Blades, there's a version of that core loop, uh, in each of those games, there is a core loop in all of your other games too. It may just not be as pronounced, right? In D and D, the core loop of D and D at its simplest is um, start somewhere safe, go somewhere dangerous, kill things, take its treasure, go back to somewhere safe, and advance. Yep, right. That is the core loop of D and D. So. In session one is when we first engage the core loop of the game. What is this game about? Um, and, and that's important because the game was designed for that core loop of play. So engaging it is giving us a chance to actually play the game as designed. Yep. The next thing you're going to do is you're going to start your first story. Um, we're talking about all these different things, but mixing this, you have to have something for the players to do that's got some sort of direction. There needs to be a story for the characters to engage in. Ideally, this is going to be part of the core loop, and it should be presenting opportunities for the players to interact, learn the rules, uh, do their flashy stuff, interact with each other, meet NPCs, learn a little bit about the, about the universe, all as the story progresses. Mm -hmm. The uh, next part is hooking the players. Um, this one's a little more abstract, but starting in the first session and going forward, you need to get everybody excited about the game. And I don't mean it's solely the GM's job, but the right. GM as the primary facilitator of the game has a responsibility to this. And it happens in set. It starts in session one, right up to now. Anticipation of the game has been fueling everybody's energy 
towards the game, right? We're excited to play this game. We're excited to play these rules, the setting. This looks really neat. I've always wanted to go, you know, I've always wanted to go uh, Space Hulk delving, whatever, right? In session one, you now need to start paying off that anticipation, right? The game experience has to start being as exciting as the expect as the anticipation was, or the energy starts to like drop out of the game. Um, how you're going to hook the players is going to depend a lot on the game, but it's usually a combination of the world, the rules, and the core loop, right? So, for instance, if we're playing a Star Trek game, session one needs to feel like a Trek episode, right? There needs to be some starship stuff probably an away mission, some sort of problem mystery to solve, right? If we don't, if we don't do that in session one, like, and we don't hook the players, like then we're getting into like this energy and interest uh, issue. We'll talk a bit more about it later in the session. Yep. And then one of the things you can do is start the actual arc of the story. This isn't necessarily mandatory, um, and sometimes you might not want to do this in session one, but sometimes you will. Session one is the place where you can start off the first story arc of your campaign. It's less important to do so. It's more important to do all the things we did above, get people out to get players in. But if you've got things rolling along, along well, you can set the seeds for the first part of your campaign. Many, one of the things you can use your first story to do is kick off your first story arc, make that story integral part of the first arc with hopes of hooking the players into the game by having them see that there's more going on than just what they're doing this week. Um, it just takes a little bit of extra work and you have to make sure that you're aware that you need to fit that in with everything else that's going on. So needless to say, this makes session one a very busy session. Absolutely. That's a lot going on for one session. Mm -hmm. Phil, if that list wasn't daunting enough, what are some of the challenges you have with session one? Yeah. So a lot of the challenges that we see in session one are kind of the same things that session one is working on addressing, right? And they pretty much fall into two large buckets, um, unfamiliarity and lack of emotional engagement. Well, let's talk about unfamiliarity. Because let's face it, session one is the first time we may be playing this sort of game. Depending on the game you're playing, you as a GM and your players may be completely unfamiliar with the following. You might not know who the characters are, who your characters are, what they can do. You might not be familiar with the setting and how things interact. And you may be unfamiliar with the rules and exactly what you're capable of doing uh, with those rules. So this can often lead to the fact that players may not be sure what actions they can take with their characters. For example, are jump checks and armor going to be more difficult or less difficult? Is the combat system gritty enough that fighting the barkeep could lead to a serious injury? And something might be as simple as, can you use the transporters at warp speed? May as well try. But because there's unfamiliarity, everything is going to take a little bit longer in session one. Players are going to question uh, and often overthink their character actions. And you're going to probably have people stopping to look up rules throughout all of session one. And this is going to make the story progress slower. And this can lead to the secondary challenge. Yeah, which the secondary challenge, as we said, is the lack of emotional engagement. Right. Early in the game, players only have potential emotional engagement. Right. They're excited about the game. Uh, their excitement about the game is getting a chance to play this character in this game world with these rules. Now, if we're lucky, the player is excited about all three of those things. Right. They like their character. They like this game world. They like these rules. But the truth is, in a lot of groups, um, not all three of those things may be true at session one. They may not be sure about their character. Maybe they do like the world. And maybe they don't really like these rules, but everybody else wanted to play this game. Hmm? Right? So, like, we don't have, like, real firm footing here yet. Right? Once you start playing, the potential engagement is replaced with actual engagement. Right? Actual engagement is built on doing things that evoke emotions in the uh, player, right, through their character. Um, but if we are unfamiliar with our character, the setting, and the rules, it's hard to get that engagement. 
um, because we're fumbling, right? We're, we're, we're not too sure about this game yet. We're fumbling through the rules. This session's coming off a little quirky. Like, I don't know. I guess it's okay. Right. Um, so if that's, if that engagement doesn't come around in the first few sessions, uh, people can lose interest. And, and this is not unlike a TV show, except that TV shows are highly engineered and scripted to, to build engagement from the get go. Yeah. Right. Um, but even, even that said, um, because of things like unfamiliarity, like there's a reason why, um, encounter at star point is it's an okay star trek story right it has all the things the star trek story has so it has some um you know um space stuff uh it's got a uh, an away mission and it's got a mystery that's uh, you know that's um discovered but like we don't as as viewers like we didn't know the characters like we didn't have a real good feel of the trek universe right and all those things and so um engagement is it, like engagement was slow building and then it didn't help that season one kind of um stunk up the joint anyway um so the thing is if we look at like the pilot for um like if we look at emissary right the pilot for deep space nine uh it gets a it gets a boost for the fact that by the time we're watching the pilot of deep space nine, even though the characters are unfamiliar, we know a lot like we as viewers, especially, you know, if you're a a Trek fan, you know, a lot more about the world coming into um, the first episode of deep Deep space nine. And I, I will also, and then I'll get off this Trek sidebar, but I think this is what, this is why for a number of us, uh, Voyager initially threw us off was you took all the familiar stuff and threw it away Mm -hmm. right like voyagers like oh cool you know a whole bunch of stuff about star trek awesome we're going to the delta quadrant where you don't know anything welcome back and for me in the 90s that was a put off like knowing stuff about the alpha quadrant was cool understanding now that they were running those shows in parallel like and they had to put one further away from the other one so that they didn't have to keep continuity um, was definitely like, I definitely did not appreciate that um, in the nineties, but I did not. um, But this is what I'm talking about, right? Let me just, let me pull it all back together. Uh, In the, in session one is our first impressions of the game, right? It's our first time to be excited about the game. And it's a hard session to get excited in with everything else that's kind of going on. And how like how fumbly how like, you're fumbling through everything yep all right so obviously session one's got a bunch of things going on it's got some serious challenges it's amazing that campaigns ever get off the ground honestly sometimes jerry since it's pretty hard to do it all at once how do we prioritize what needs to go into our session one all right um, if you're going to have a fun and productive session one, one of the things you can do is, is figure out what you need to do. As with many things, you're going to vary with the game you're playing, your experience with it, and your group are going to change all of these. But consider some of the following questions as you determine what your session one is going to actually need. Yeah. Um, regarding characters, how much of characters' backgrounds were covered in session zero? How much of it was um, discussed leading up to the game? Um, how well do the characters actually need to know each other before the action starts? Like, do we need to know everybody's personal background, uh, before, you know, the, you know, before we get into the, you know, into the action or does just kind of knowing everybody's name, role and description good enough to get going? The next thing we're going to look at is setting. Basically, are, is the GM and the players familiar with the overall setting of the game? Have any of you played this session setting before? And how much of the setting does someone need to know before the action starts? If you're playing in Forgotten Realms and you've ever played D&D before, you've pretty much got the basics of what's going to happen. But if you're playing in something like Dark Sun or Eberron or Planescape, you're going to need to have some setting interaction um, throughout the game so people know what the differences are and what they're going to be doing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
when it comes to rules, how um, are you and your players familiar with the rules with, of the game? Um, if mm-hmm. you're the only one that's familiar with it, are you familiar enough to be able to teach everybody uh, mm-hmm. the game as you go? Have you played these rules before? Um, based on the adventure you're running, what mechanics do you know are going to come up in that session? Like, no, I'm going to have a couple skill checks, definitely going to be some combat, definitely going to be some wilderness tra- travel, etc. Next, you need to look at your story. What are the characters going to be doing this session? Um, is it something we can make sure that everybody's going to be involved in? And then does this, does this need to tie into any larger arc or can this just be a freestanding story? So, Based on all those questions, you can start to figure out what you need to focus on and what you need to look at. It's possible that based on this list, especially for a new game that no one has played, that the answers to all of those questions may be quite long. Yeah, that could be a lot to fit in one session. Phil, for our games, personally at home, you adopted a four-session rule. What is it, and how can it help you with your session one? Yeah, so years ago... Um, our gaming group, we adopted what we call the four session rule. And I think we've just like, we've never, we've never, um, we've never let it go. Right. We've, we've had it for many, many years. Um, and it goes like this, right. Um, after we play four sessions of a game, uh, we decide if we like the game and if we want to keep playing it. Uh, and what we learned is that if we made that decision after session one, we really don't actually have enough information. <clears throat> Right. If we made that decision after session one, we probably should can a lot more games. Um, so as we've been discussing already, so much stuff goes into session one that it's not easy to pull off a great session. Right. For session one, um, even when you do player investments, still a little shaky. Right. Because everything's still really new. So your great session might be pretty good. Right. Like your players take it away as like, oh, that's pretty good session. Like not bad. But not like it's rare to get a great session one. Um, In addition, it's hard in session one to understand everything about the game, right? You're only playing for four hours. You don't like you may not have gotten through the core loop. You may not have advanced a character. Um, You may not have even like had a combat, depending on your game. Um, So because of that, like our group rule, right, our our social contract thing uh, says that we give any new game for sessions. Um, This way we've had more time to kind of engage all the rules, the core loop, do a little advancement. Sometimes it's even just the players now have played their character for four sessions and realize like, ugh, this ability I took hasn't come up at all in four sessions. Um, Which is why we also have a policy that within the first four sessions, you can change out any part of your character uh, during those sessions, because um, what did you know when you started making your character, having never played the game before, right? You pick some stuff at random out of a book. Um, you don't know if it's going to work or not. Um, so after four sessions, if it didn't work, swap it out, right? If you don't like it, swap it out. Um, so that's what we do, right? We go four sessions and then we make a decision. A- and the way this helps session one is that if you use this rule, you can take some of the pressure off of session one and distribute that whole list of things and accomplish them over the first four sessions, right? And it just kind of relieves the pressure of packing everything into session one. All right. So, for example, you don't have to cram everything into this first session. Allows you to stretch out stories, stretch out character introductions, stretch out abilities. This gives you time to review the rules between sessions and gives you a chance to further hone them as you figure out which rules worked and maybe which things you need to go over again. The fact that characters can make tweaks early on allows them to adjust their characters to fit the role they had. They may think that they want to do one thing with their character, and the choices they made don't allow them to do that as well as something else. And you can, because you're doing a four session, uh, session one, you can have a long initial story, or you can just take your time letting it play through. Um, you can have one story that stretches out over those arcs, or you can even have multiple little stories across those first four sessions. Yeah, and the four session rule is not a cure all for session one, but more, it's rather more of an agreement that no one makes any judgments about the game until you've played all four sessions, right? So it just, it, it takes the pressure off of session one. Like if your session one does not go well, or it's just eh, 
like you have three more sessions to build up, uh, build upon it and build up that engagement before anyone decides whether or not we're going to continue on with the game or not. All right. So now that we've unpacked what's going on and what the potential issues are, Jerry, what are some tips for GMs that are getting ready to do their session ones? When which priorities are for session one? Well, just as we talked about above, we're going to give you a list of tips. And again, these are in no order. And you should pick and choose these tips based on your needs. Yeah. I think I just want to caveat this because we talked a little bit about this pre-show. Um, not all of these apply in every situation. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like if you, for instance, if you like, you're really familiar with the rules of your game, some of these don't actually, like, you don't need to do some of these. This is, um, this just is, is, assumes nothing about your game. You'll know which ones of these you yep. want to stick with and which ones you want to break. Um, so starting with that, start with a simple story with so many things going on in session one, don't roll out a complicated plot for your first session. You got enough to juggle and complicating a plot with twists and, you know, turns and, you know, backstabbing and all that stuff. Like, it doesn't really need to be one of them. Like, just a straight, simple, uh, straight, simple plot for your first story uh, will go a long way. Number two, don't start with any lengthy world descriptions. I cannot stress this <laughs> enough. The number of times I've been in session ones with GMs. And you're 30 minutes in and they're still talking about all the things that make this game that the, the game it is. Um, player engagement is going to require them to engage. Don't have them sitting there while you give them a 30 minute history lesson of your world. Work that information in different parts of the session or make a handout they can look at between things going on. If it's something that's really important, make it a question answer thing as opposed to just you laying things out, but try to get to the actual playing of the game as quickly as possible yeah agreed and i'm and i echo the same thing you said about having to sit there while somebody tells you about their yeah. world uh also having the challenge of having written a game called hydro hackers um and doing one shot uh i have to be very like i i try to be very careful about how much like no more than a few minutes to describe this world yep, yep. right like, we'll talk more about the world once we get into playing. I need to tell you a few little things about the world, and then we got to, like, we got to get moving, right? Oh. Like, okay. Yep. Um, next one, build scenes that go over rules gradually. Um, again, this one caveated with the fact that, like, if you're familiar with the game, you don't have to do any of this. But if you're unfamiliar with the game, construct some of your early scenes to teach core mechanics, right? Start simple, work your way up through the more complex rules. Um, if this is the first time you as the GM is running, are running the game. Um, and I said, you know, this is, I think where Jerry and I had <laughs> Jerry and I differed in our pre show discussion. If you were running the game for the first time and like, you've never used these rules before, like I wouldn't open with an in media res fight scene, right? Like, I don't think I would start the first words of my game as role initiative. Um, no, no. I would lean into like, Hey, let's do a couple skill checks or let's try a move or like, Let's do a move or two and then like, okay, cool. Now we can lead into our first fight. Yeah. It's going to depend on the game though. Um, if you know the rules, rules well enough, it might work to have a fight clearly on. And it's going to depend a little bit on your players and the kind of game you're playing. Um, if the game has a lot of combat, like D&D, &D, Savage Worlds, Dungeon World, Genesis, um, this might be something that gets them immediately into the, into the core conflict resolution mechanic of the game. Um, because... In a lot of those games, combat is the main focus of the design of those games. And players tend to design their characters for that. And if you've got the guy who's playing the big burly barbarian, he wants to know what happens when he swings his axe. That being said, if your game isn't focused on combat, you can switch to something else. Um, if it's in masks, you know, get in some virtual personal drama early on and maybe let the bull punch something. If it's an investigative game, start doing an investigation right off the bat. But the important thing is engage that core something, get them rolling dice early so they can see what their characters can do right off the bat. Now, sure. go ahead. No, yeah, good. Um, um, oh, yeah, you're the, next. The, <laughs> coloring is all over the place here. Um, so yeah, if you um, so if you need to bring characters together in the opening of this of a session, like do it quickly. Like don't again, like the thirty minutes kind of thing. Don't spend an hour trying to like you know, weave your characters together. Uh, if the characters don't know each other and are being brought together for the first time, 
And hopefully you've already taken care of that during session zero. But if not, do that in the first few minutes to avoid playing a long scene with each character. Get them there quickly, give them time to interact, get them playing the game. Exactly. Okay. Uh, the next one, I'm pretty, I'm pretty staunch about this. Um, mm-hmm. Do not subvert the main tropes of the world or the core loop of the game in the first story. Right? Mm-hmm. If your game is about cyberpunk runners doing missions, your first, jo- your first adventure needs to be a mission. Um, you want your session to be somewhat stereotypical so the group gets a feel for the core loop of the game and the main tropes of the game. Later in the campaign, you can subvert all those things um, and shake things up. And again, if you have played this game a bunch of times previously, like if you're playing 5e and you've played a whole bunch of 5e and you want to subvert some tropes on the get go, perfectly fine. But if you're like trying to get the players into understanding what this game does, You want to lean into the tropes. You want to lean into the core loop so that everybody starts to understand how the game goes. Next, Uh, you want to be sure that you start out with uh, having rule handouts. You can find out a lot of them online these days. If you play any role-playing game that isn't something you made up yourself, chances are somebody out there has made a really nice cheat sheet or some rules handouts that the players could have for access, Uh, especially if your game has lots of rules or has things that become important like combat is its own mechanic or a game like um, Blades in the Dark where uh, or a Band of Blades even where every phase of the game is going to have something different going on. Um, <clears throat> print out your move sheets for PBTA. Get them GM moves for yourself. And if you're a player, find some of these things. If there's something that you like, if you're a player and you are a spellcaster, maybe get those spell cards or find the PDF and print them out or, or whatever. Um, I'll say when, when Pathfinder first came out, there was a group that did like for a dollar, you could get, it was a, a drive through RPG thing where you could, uh, download, print your own spell cards and they had all the, all the spells for each level. So you, just, you could just print them out on a sheet and have them in front of you with everything laid out. Um, have that stuff for yourself. And, uh, you know, if you're the GM and you need to maybe print those out for your players, and they don't have them. But mm-hmm. have all those rules together so you spend less time looking up rules, more times playing the game. Agreed. And I'll just say this. I don't think it's been a problem in recent years, but if you are designing a PBTA game and you do not put your GM um, principles, agendas, and um, uh, moves onto a sheet for the GM, shame on you. Um, in the early days of PBTA, there were a couple of games where I had to go make the GM uh, sheet for the game i don't think it's been a problem as of late but um that's a huge pet peeve of mine um as the gm i very much want to just look down at a sheet to see my available moves so that i know what move to take rather than trying to like hit the book and find something um but yeah i'm a huge proponent in fact i've done um i think gnome stew articles i think we've done a um somewhere in the two is somewhere in the 100s i think we did a misdirected mark episode about how to make your own handouts um all of those things um i made uh i think i remade all of the handouts for um uh blades in the dark and um scum and villainy because i didn't like uh the i didn't like the ones that came with the game um so yes i fully support that one okay um next one combine session one of try to combine session one objectives into into single scenes, right? Find ways to combine some of the things that you need to get done in session one into like a, into a single scene so that you're like killing two birds with one stone. Like for instance, if your wizard school campaign, if you're playing your wizard school campaign and in session, like in session one, you could start in class, right? With the instruction instructor giving a lecture, which gives you the opportunity to provide some information about the campaign world. And then have them practicing casting a spell, which gives them a chance to engage the rules, right? So we've, we've done a little bit of rule work and we've done a little bit of, of conveying world information all in one scene that's active, right? So where the players are doing something, it's engaging, that kind of thing. Next, don't feel like you have to engage every subsystem of your game in session one. If you're playing a game with lots and lots of subsystems, don't try to jam them all into session one. Just focus on one or two systems session one and roll with the others in subsequent sessions. 
Um, if you're going to be playing a game that has um, different rules for vehicle chases and starship combat and droid hacking and the like, unless that is a player's main focus, don't try to cram them all into one session. Um, it's more important to, to focus on letting each player get a chance to do something that makes them cool so you can see what makes their character click than trying to get everybody involved in everything at the same time. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, yeah. I mean, I I don't know if you you named you, the the subsystems you named um, remind me of exactly one game, which was D20 Star Wars. Mm -hmm. D20 Star Wars had like a a somewhat ridiculous number of subsystems. Like there was like regular combat. There was um, spaceship combat. There was vehicle combat chases kind of thing. And very, like, very much do not try to pack those all in. Um, I think this is the same thing that people who play Burning Wheel will tell you, um, is also do not try to, uh, jam in all of the Burning Wheel subsystems in, in a, in a single session, like phase them in over time. Yep. All right. Well, that's a lot of tips for the GM. Phil, what do we have for players who are going to be playing in a session one? Oh, man. Time to take out my chip on my shoulder, right? Pat my chip. All right. There are things as players you can do and should do to help the group have a good session one. Uh, here are a few things that you can do. First of all, if you're a player, read the rules. While a lot of players like the GM read the rules of the game and try to learn the rules from them, if you're a player, you should learn the rules outside the game. Doing this helps the GM, means it makes less work, that it can be done to, to reach full rules mastery for yourself and for the GM, especially rules that protect your, pertain to your character. If you're a spellcaster, learn how to cast spells. Um, you can also do this by listening to APs. A lot of them will teach you the rules as you go. And don't be afraid to learn the rules of other players in the game, especially if you've got players that aren't quite as rule savvy. Um, I've been in campaigns many times where we've had players in the group who just remembering rules isn't their strong suit and sometimes you had the person who has that 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 skill for remembering rules. If you're that player, you can get in there and help other players prep up for the game, especially when it's coming up on their turn. Do that. Learn the rules. Makes it easier for the GM. When I was GMing, um, I'm going to go back to Pathfinder. When I was GMing Pathfinder, I had a player who had anomalous eidetic memory. And I would sometimes assign him homework because he loved it. I'm like, next week, uh, explain to us how attacks of opportunity work. It's in the rules, but we always get it messed up. And sometimes... We would be doing something. I'm like, all right, we're coming up on whatever's next. You know, Aaron, when you get a chance, uh, check up on the rule for this. So that when we get there, you can just tell us what's going on. And he loved that. He loved being the the rules lawyer, so to speak. But it helped me out as a GM because it meant that while I knew all the rules, I didn't have to memorize that one rule on page 157 for what happens when people try to do competitive tiddlywinks. He could just look that up and tell us what the rules were. Um, roll D20 against each other. But uh, that sort of thing helps out a lot next uh similar to the rules read up on the setting if you are unfamiliar with the setting of the game read the setting material that's provided for the players in the rule book right often um rule books will have like some setting stuff in the front that's like made for everybody gm and players and then it probably has like a lot more setting stuff stuffed in the back for the gm read the front stuff um just to get yourself up to speed with the world um, the more of it that you are familiar with it, uh, with it, the less the GM has to, um, lecture and explain, um, the world. Now, if you're playing a homebrew, this isn't really going to be possible, but like, for instance, if you're playing Numenera, read that front section of the book. It's got a lot of cool stuff that will be what you will need to know about the ninth world, right? That kind of thing. Next, as we pointed out earlier, if you're a player, help define or make your handouts. The GM is going to be doing a lot to get this game going. And if you have some time, make or find some handouts for the game would be a big help. Um, somebody who's really good at this for us is a um, friend of the show, uh, Glenn Seiler. Almost every time we play a game, at some point, Glenn's going to link us to something that he found online where, hey, guys, here's a quick summary of the rules. Or, hey, here's something that we found that's a quick. And doing that makes it a lot easier for everybody else to find it and get going. And means that the GM, often Phil, doesn't have to do that part, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, in general, if you've got this, find these handouts or find these links, find these APs, whatever, 
and get the other players involved in them. Yeah. Huge, huge. Um, like, you know, of all the things I'm doing as a GM prepping to get session one off the ground, if somebody's like, Hey, I found some cool handouts, like awesome, cool. Send them to me. Cause I'm going to go laminate some for everybody or whatever. Yep. Um, tying into something that, um, Jerry said earlier about rules. Um, I, I broke it out here for a little more detail, learn the specific rules for your character. Of all the rules the GM has to learn, they are not going to take time to memorize all of your powers, all of your abilities, the moves on your playbook or whatever, right? Um, This is your job. You need to become the expert in how your character works. Playing the Barbarian, you are now the expert in the Barbarian class. Learn it, live it, love it. Next, get comfortable with your character. Between Session 0 and Section 1, Take some time to think about your character. What, what are you interesting about? Um, you know, what makes them interesting to you? How are they going to sound? What quirks are you going to play at the table? Do they have any funny lines? Do you have any interesting backstories? Um, and what is it that gets you excited about that character? The more comfortable you are with all your characters, the easier it's going to be to slip into that character when the play starts. Mm -hmm. I'm going to add one more to the list because Andy Fox um, brought up a great one, which is uh, take the bait, right? Session one is often that clumsy moment where you're trying to get the players engaged into the first story and they're trying to get to know each other. um, And the GMs like basically put like rolling out the first story as players grab onto that story, both hands and pull, right? Like, Go right into that story. Don't give the GM a hard time about like, oh, it's spooky. We're not going to the house. Like, no, you're playing Tales from the Loop. Like, of course you're going to the house, right? Like, that's what you do, right? So, you know, take that hook, run, just run with it. Um, It takes a, it's just one more thing the GM doesn't have to worry about, which is like trying to get the story uh, rolling. So do your part. Um, Even if it's ham fisted, even if it's not the most original opening, whatever, take it and go. Yep. Cool. Okay. That's our overview of session one. We're going to check in with the chat room in a moment. Thanks again, Andy Fox, for that cool uh, tip that we got to add to the uh, end of that segment. Um, So we'll check in with the chat room for any further insight and wisdom. But first, Bob, tell us about another show on the Misdirected Mark Network. All right. Tonight we're going to talk about bonus experience. Ray and Monica are two old friends exploring gameplay and design through the lens of diversity while also sharing some of the dumbest humor gaming has to offer. I really enjoyed uh, 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 meeting Ray and Monica when we had the opportunity and their energy and their dynamic is great. Excuse me. So I highly recommend checking this out. All right. Yeah. I mean, they're hilarious, right? Yeah. So absolutely. And not only, you know what? It's funny. We say hilarious all the time. They're also chock full of really good advice. Oh, yeah. Like, I like hilarity, but I, 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 I don't want to make it sound like that's the only draw to the show. They're chock full of good gaming, GMing, and design advice um, as well. Um, they also turn out to be funny, which for me is the sugar in my medicine. Yeah. Right? A little bit of sugar makes the medicine go down. I like a little bit of funny with my GMing advice. Yeah. There you go. Cool. Humor always adds a little bit to things that can tend to be dry. Um, you know, mm-hmm. it, 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 it helps to break things up. So good stuff. All right. Um, Andy also said uh, they started their monster hearts game in, in the class that they all shared. Like you were talking about your, uh, your wizard school example, similar thing there. Um, that gives the GM an opportunity to kind of combine some things into uh, into one scene for their session so that they can uh, tick things off the list. Um, Excuse me. And uh, A-Bomb asked, is it okay to introduce the big bad as a foreshadow in session one? You can. If the game is smooth enough for you, you can. But it's not something you have to do. You can just tell a story that's just self-contained. Yeah. But it is okay to foreshadow that if you have a story that allows you to do that without interrupting the flow of getting everybody involved. Yeah. Yeah, and if your big bad is um, 
you know, if your big bad is later going to be some sort of um, face heel turn or something, like it's perfectly fine to introduce them as a, um, you know, as, as one of the characters, let the players get to know them so that, you know, six sessions down the road, you can, you know, do your um, face heel turn and everybody will be like, oh, you bastard, right? That kind of thing. But like rolling out like your big bad is like, I am the big bad who's threatening this town. I am going to be the, you know, the climax of this campaign arc. As Jerry said, you can totally do it. But remember that there's not a lot of personal investment in session one, right? So if you roll out the villain now, it's not going to get the big response. They'll build that response over time. Yeah. Um, So... Yeah, roll it out if you want. Roll it out if it makes sense for your story. Roll it out if you're feeling comfortable that you can also juggle that with everything else. But also, session two or three is a great time to roll that villain out. Yep. Like, have a bunch of creatures attack the village. No one knows who's leading them. And in session two or three, have some guy come out of the woodwork and be like, I'll just send my minions to attack the village again. Dun, dun, dun. Yep. There you go. Totally works that way, too. There is, now, there is a famous uh, Pathfinder story arc where the one of the major villains starts out as one of the people that the players help in the first set of sessions that and that doesn't foreshadow them as a villain but at least gets them introduced so that the players can talk to them later on that's okay but it does but it's also not the very first session um again you you need to keep things simple the first session so yeah it's um it's just tough right it's tough to um it's tough to evoke that um, the, I'll say the better way to do it is that if you want to roll out the big, this is going to sound counter to some of the other things I said, but with so much going on in session one, if you want the big bad to be the big bad starting session one, just tell everybody that as part of the game, right? Yeah. Like this, like this kingdom is terrorized by Baron Von Badass. Like just open that up in your first few sentences, yeah, absolutely. then have... And then have Baron Von Badass's guys terrorize the village and everybody will be like, that bastard, right? Like, you can just, you can just, um, you don't have to, it's an odd case of you can just um, say it rather than show it. Yeah. I don't, I mean, that, I'm not a big advocate all over the place for that, but it is a good place to just put that in. Yep. Yeah, if that's yep. going to be a core conceit of the campaign right out of the gate, then sure, yeah, that's that's not a bad mm-hmm. way to handle it. Like, look, this is how we want to want to do this, or this is how I was thinking of doing this. Everybody's like, yeah, that's that sounds great. I'm on board for that. And you've yeah, got I mean, that wrapped up already. Boom. You don't have the players discover the Empire in a Star Wars game. Yeah. Right? The, em- <laughs> the Empire is the there, right? There. These mm-hmm. are bad guys. They're the Empire. They blow you know planets up and terrorize people. And then that way, when they see them, the players know how to take the appropriate action. Yep. Right. It's like, should we talk so. to these guys in the white armor and see what they're, you know, what they're up, you know, what they're all we're about? We're super lost, man. Like, we're super like, lost. Hey, we're Can trying to get us? to this uh, rebel base. Do you guys know where the where the rebels are? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Bad. Let's take these two droids somewhere. Uh. Yeah. We're taking- <laughs> Do you, do you guys? I mean, can you? Is there a lost and found on this dirt on this on this desert planet? Like we've got these two. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Let me just let me just say as a quick sidebar before we jump back in, without any serious spoilers, um, I watched the first episode of um, Boba Fett, and man, Jawas, man, yep. can always count on them, Jawas. right? Like just, <laughs> I love Jawas. <laughs> fucking fucking Jawas, man. Yep. They're the up. Ewoks. They're the Ewoks of the Sandy Planets. It's what they basically are. <laughs> There's your campaign. There's your campaign right there. Jawa, right. <laughs> an Ewok, and a Gundan, Gungan. Like there's your. <laughs> that's your campaign that right like a there. Horrible joke. Man, Ewok I would be bar. all over playing that campaign. I would play that <laughs> campaign to death. I play the Ewok, man. Nothing scarier. Yeah, I'd, I'd probably end up being the Gungan. <laughs> I've played a Gungan. I've played a Gungan uh, Jedi Master in, in in a campaign and had a good time doing that. So, did you still have um, long ears? Oh yes. Feel- <laughs> Misa got floppy ears. Got long eye stalks, and Misa That's strong right. with the Force. Oh boy! There you go. All right. On that note, we should right. go back into the <laughs> second part of this. Get thing. us out of here, Bob. Punch it, punch it, Chewy. <laughs> Welcome back. We're gonna jump into the roundtable uh, discussion, starting with this question, Phil. 
Question one, what session one activity do you enjoy doing, enjoy participating in, or are good at? In session one, I like immediately jumping into that core concept. If it's a superhero game, let's do something superheroic. A small supervillain encounter or a rescue or something. Um, let's let's use our superhero powers. If it's a if it's a horror game, have something creepy happen early on to kind of set the mood. Um, if it's a fantasy combat game, let's do something. Let's you know encounter each other and then let's get into a fight with some you know bandits or something on that line. But basically, get using the core mechanic right off the bat. Get the core tone. Let the players see what their characters can do. Um, and make it awesome. I mean, that's the other thing is, is show competence, like make sure the characters get to do something that they're good at early on. Um, and, uh, and, and make it quick. Um, uh, I literally wrote an entire adventure, uh, for dark city games based around the idea that the entire thing was showing the players doing their cool stuff and writing different encounters for them to do that so that they immediately get into doing something fun instead of just wandering around for a while. Keep it focused. Bob? Yeah, I don't I don't know that there's one particular thing that really stands out. Um, if I had to put my finger on something, I would then say probably um, I, I, I kind of enjoy the meet and greet of all the characters getting together and, and, and you know, you needed a tavern kind of a thing. Um, but nothing like really like, I don't like, Oh, I love this one part. It's just like getting the ball rolling. Session one is session one. Let's get this campaign underway. So it's kind of just an overall thing for me. <clears throat> How about you, Phil? Cool. Uh, for me, I would say in more recent times, like I really like, um, I really like bringing characters together but I, but I really like to do it mimicking the genre that we're playing. Right. So like most recently I did this for you guys in Knights Black Agents. When we did our first mission, I was like, we're playing in Stockholm. And I was like, you know, we're playing. So this is, you know, for people who aren't familiar, Knights Black Agents, Jason Bourne versus vampires. Right. So I said to you guys, I said, um, okay, you all arrive in the city differently. Describe your scene. Uh, as you arrive in the city. Right. And so like, I think one of you was on a ferry, right. Like coming into the city, like looking over, like looking out over the, you know, the boat, uh, somebody came off the train. Um, somebody, um, somebody was driving in, you know, in their, like in a car that they had boosted that kind of thing. And, um, I know I did when we opened our, our session one for our masks campaign, um, started with you guys, um, beating a villain on the rooftop of, um, on the rooftop of, um, God, I forget the name of the building, but it was on top of one of the uh, major components in our game. And I don't even think I, I, I don't even remember if I let you guys roll or I was just like, and with that, the bad guy, like, you know, falls down or whatever. And you, you know, you capture him. but it was like very comic book, right? Like open, yeah. like we opening panel kind of, um, kind of stuff. So I really like, um, I really like trying to come up with these genre openings. Um, because again, I love genre in games. So like my whole, um, my whole shtick is to try, try to get those openings to feel like, the thing that we're playing. Good. We appreciate that too. Cause that's, that always, that's always more fun. But we now adopted that NBA opening as the opening for every mission. Like when we switch cities, yep. I was like, cause we just switched cities and I was like, cool, we're doing it again. Yep. Like yep. I, cause I, I just now it's, and in fact, I'm going to write a gnome store article about this on Friday about making your own tropes in your games. Yeah. Like making certain things into tropes. Yep. Good idea. And why yep. you want might why you might want to do it. Anyway. Next question. All right. Question number two. What session one activity do you not enjoy? Or what session one activity do you struggle with, Bob? Yeah, so for me, sometimes it's getting into character. I don't always have a great handle on who I'm playing when we go into that first session. Um it, it all it all depends on on what the game is the the initial excitement level going into session zero, and what happens in that session. 
And sometimes it just, it takes me a few sessions to really figure out who I'm playing. So that can be uh, uh, kind of a burden sometimes. I, I often thought? have that same problem, especially if it's a setting that I'm not familiar with. Yeah. Trying to find a hook can be difficult. Yeah, I try, I try very hard when we're first playing a game. Um, my initial character concept is like, I try to keep it super simple. I'll let it beef up after the first four sessions, but I try like, like, I just want to, like, I just, I'm going to be kind of a little one dimensional for the first session or two so that I can actually focus on being that one dimension. Right. So like I can do that well and not worry about too much more. Like um, I know, like when we played um, dungeon world uh, eons ago, Bob, like I had a really simple concept for uh, my barbarian and yep. didn't actually think anything about my character's past. I was like, oh, yeah, he's from some place called the Axe Torn Valley. Um, like, that's it. Yep. <laughs> like, like, we'll we'll see if I need we'll see if I need to unpack anymore. Now, I will say this. And, and we've talked about this before with character backgrounds. You should write as much character background or do as much character background work as you need to be comfortable playing your character. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I am very comfortable starting with very little information getting a, and letting my character grow a little in the game and then filling in some more stuff. And like afterwards, that's kind of just a pattern I like, but you know, if you need, if you need to want to write a couple pages before you start the game, yep. you do that. You feel free to do that. All right. And I'm going to steer you back into this question. Yep. What do I don't, what do I not enjoy? I, um, I do not enjoy, I'm, I do not enjoy, or I should say I'm not awesome at juggling rules and story. So um, if we are all playing a game for the first time and we're all learning it together, um, I have a huge, I have a huge problem with getting rules wrong or guessing at them. So I will like stop the game, break out the book, look it up kind of thing. Um, because I just, I'm not. And roll right now. Like if I'm learning the game, it's like, oh, no, let's go look and see what it's supposed to be later in the campaign when I have like some more rules mastery and then something comes up and I just want to make an arbitrary, not an arbitrary, but I want to make an informed um, ruling on it. Then I'm very comfortable to be like, uh, you know what? The situation doesn't exactly match anything. Eh, let's just call it a D10 for the game. It's fine once I'm comfortable. When I'm first learning, I'm very much about and probably too much about uh, getting it right. So that's that's a that's a place where I always struggle when we're starting a new game. Yep. Next, you, uh, I I have trouble getting everybody involved, emotionally involved, without getting bogged down in description. Um, sometimes it can be tough to find ways to include everyone, especially if they're unfamiliar with the genre. Um, this has happened a couple times. I mentioned before, but I try to run a superhero campaign with players who aren't familiar with the genre, um, or if you're trying to play a story-based game with a bunch of people who are used to playing hack and slash um or just people who don't watch or read a lot of horror and you're doing a game that's going to involve some some scariness or horror trying to get a way to get everybody involved um if they're unfamiliar with the campaign so that they have some idea what they want to be um getting that all together especially in that first session one can be very very difficult um and making sure there's something for everybody involved so everything there kind of gets can often be kind of messy for that first session. Cool. All right. Last question. As a player, how much prep do you typically put into session one? Yeah. So historically, and I haven't played in, in, in a while, I've actually um, over the last couple of years run far more than I've played. Um, I would say not much. Um, I will do a little work to make sure I understand the mechanics of the game um, but like, I probably should read more about the mechanics of the game. I'm thinking about like when we played Call of Cthulhu with Chris, um, I definitely didn't know those rules very well. I mean, I got the hang of it after a few sessions, but, um, could have done a little bit more prep on that. Um, I do, I do some work to get into my character. Um, I'm not too bad at that. I will definitely get an, an initial character concept off the ground and like let it evolve during play. I'm okay with that. Um, so I'll show up as a character, like I'll, you know, I'll present and play my character, but, um, 
I probably, I probably would benefit from doing more. Like after I made that list in the, in the last segment, I was like, ah, damn, man. Like I don't, I don't do these things. Yep. Like, like I'm writing them down and I'm like, oh man, this is clearly a case of do what I say, not what I do. Um, Cause I'm not doing nearly enough of those things should definitely be doing some more of those things. Jer. Uh, it's going to depend on the game. Um, when I used to play, I used to put tons of prep time into long campaigns. If we were going to be playing something for a while. I do a ridiculous amount. I remember playing uh, Mega Traveler where we had, I had a, a 10 page character background and did a three page history on the planet that we were from and so on and so forth. I did all that stuff as a player. Um, but uh, number one, I don't have the time for that anymore. But also, a lot of the games I've played lately have been very shorter arcs where we're going to play maybe one, two or three week story arc in the game, and then we might not go any further. Uh, I don't put as much time as I probably should. Um, just because it's hard to get invested in a character that you're not going to see around much. You know, you're, you might get 10 sessions out of them, and that's going to be the end of it. And so it's hard to get as emotionally invested in them, so I don't get as emotionally invested in them. Um, same as if I'm in a game where I don't expect the character to survive, I don't get as super invested in them. I didn't spend a lot of time prepping for session one of Dungeon Crawl Classics until we were quite a ways into it. Um, it's also a little harder without as much face-to-face time. Uh, in the past, especially when I was in college um, or when I was running my, my weekly game when I lived in Auburn, um, we would sometimes sit with the GM or other players and talk about specific rules, backgrounds, interconnecting. Um, you know, when I was in college, we'd sit up at night talking about um, the campaign and what we wanted to do and what we were going to what we were going to do, um, seeing how things interconnect. Uh, we don't have as much of that face to face time, and we also don't have as much just plain old time period. And um, it's a little more difficult to get that out of game discussion of characters and stuff. Um, especially when you're still in the middle of a short adventure. Like right now, um, we're doing Knights Black Agents. We, we're still kind of in the middle of the very first story arc. We haven't had time to really branch out and do it. We, we discussed it at the camp. We haven't had any downtime. The entire, what, what are we at now? Five or six game sessions in? You're and like I four think, missions in. Like, yeah. And, and we're, I think it's been a grand total of like six days of, 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 playtime for our characters since we first got together there hasn't been time to kind of flesh out our characters and what we're going to do and hopefully that'll come out afterwards yeah um, i mean i I will say this just for that game yeah um i'm highly encouraging that after this mission that we like um jump a month later like i would like to do a thing going around the table like where did you lay low for your month like Mm -hmm. Where did you recoup? Where did you, you know, that kind of thing. Like you guys have been on this like really tight timetable because we started with a pretty um, exciting kind of um, uh, admission. And then you've been like closely chasing the the bad guys on the tail end of this. But it is coming at somewhat of a cost. Like we haven't really done um, player stuff. We're having trouble finding time to recuperate those yeah. kinds of things. So it would be um, it would be cool to actually take a deep breath and slow the game down for a little bit and then work you guys back in to your next. That mission. also ha- but that also happens at the beginning of games. Like player prepped them. Like this looks like it's actually going to be a game that lasts. Sometimes we've had a couple of these games that we've run for three weeks, and I didn't really get invested in the character until we've been in the game for a couple of weeks. And I probably should try to develop my character a little more be- before that. So yeah. that's me. Bob? Yeah, I'm going to just a quick uh, uh, tack on to one of the things that you said about um, not <clears throat> being emotionally invested in the character you know is only going to go for a short period of time. I have the complete opposite of that. Um, if I know this is a finite thing, it's only going to go X number of sessions, we know this in advance, that's almost like a one shot ride it like you stole it if it's a mystery and you have no idea how how many sessions you're going to get out of it and you're just kind of like going along like i'm waiting for that thing to kick in that's going to really spark me then maybe you know i'll i'll fluctuate a little bit but i would be way more into just jumping onto it and riding a concept and 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 going hog wild if i know it's going to be finite right out of the gate 
But otherwise, for me, um, prep for going into session one is going to vary for me by game and how excited I am going in. If I've nailed an exciting character concept coming out of session zero, then I will often put a whole bunch of stuff into uh, prep before session one where I'll, uh, I'll do things like uh, create some quotes that my character will, will, will throw out here and there, um, different stuff like that. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's going to depend on that, and that excitement level coming out of session zero. If I'm still not a hundred percent sure, um, then I kind of just like kind of ride the wave into session one and, and see where that goes and, 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 and come out of that with whatever I get. So that's, that's where I am. <clears throat> Excuse me. That cool, idea. Cool. All right. All right. So that was our discussion about session one. Yeah, we hope the next time you start up a new campaign, which we hope is fairly soon, uh, that some of these tips will help you out. And we're going to check in with the chat room one more time and then head off to the conversation corner. We were talking earlier, Phil mentioned uh, creating new tropes for your game. Uh, and Chromatic Chameleon uh, made a comment that's great. Uh, in their Ravenloft arc, they made it a trope that every time someone says Strahd, lightning flashes above the mountains and thunder is heard. And I love I love it. That is good stuff. Yeah, I love it. Luther. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, man. (laughs) Uh, Excuse me. Queen uh, Sendog agrees with me that uh, uh, knowing that there's a short-term character, short-term limit on how long this character is going to get to play leads her to really just ride, you know, wild ride, just jump on and go. Um, it's, as a, uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious about this as opposed to what, like, I'm wondering if that we're all just thinking this through wrong, right? Like if a game's going to last forever, why would you not just jump on it and ride it? Like you stole it. But that's the thing you don't know. Like the plan is we're going to see, we're going to have an extended campaign, but you don't know yeah. how long it's going to go. You don't know when it's going to kick in. You don't know if you're going to hit session four and be like, eh, Somebody's not really getting it, you know. Let's kill it and 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 go into somebody else. Oh, you know, so like you're yeah. sure of whether the rest of yeah. the group might kill your excitement. Ex- exactly. Yeah. So you don't know that's- for sure. Like the plan is, let's do a campaign that's extended. But I see. You don't know okay. for sure. For, 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 you're like, for example, Ooh. you know, I look at that different than once. You know, one shot, I'll ride it like I stole it because I know what I've got for finite time. But I like. The number of games that we've that we've started and gotten three sessions into didn't even make the session four over the last couple of years. Um, I don't get excited about those characters until we get to session four. So here's I the probably thing should I'm, I probably should. But here's the thing I'm worried about, right? Yeah. Now, granted, in the last two years, gaming's been pretty rough, right? In yeah. terms of yeah. trying to create mental engagement and things kind like of an that. Anomaly. Of course. Right. But here's the thing I get concerned about. If everybody is reserved for the first four sessions, who's going to be excited to go past session four? Exactly. That that's that that's the problem. I, I see that. Well, uh, see, I don't I don't look at it as as like for me, there still can be excitement and interest in the campaign. Now, the excitement level may not be super high, but the it's it's an interest excitement uh uh uh, like a, like a bar graph, like they're both in different spots, and they can both be you know above midline, and it's like all right, we're good. Um, but if if we don't know where you're going, I mean, it's I I I just don't so I don't think the word reserved there, works also, for me. There's also so, a difference. There's also a difference between reserved character investment and reserved play style. So that I think is, that I think is what I was leaning towards is investment versus engagement, right? Like I don't need you to be invested until session five or starting in session five, but I need the table to be exciting for us to want to go to session five. Yeah. 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 Like, like I, like when we played the sprawl, I had almost no personality for my character for the first couple. Cause I had no idea. Cause we started a second time. The first one went yeah. two weeks. We changed the rules twice. We fizzled out. We came back. So I'm like, 
all right, I'm I'm if I was at the point of I'm going to play this character and have a good time and I liked my character, but if he died, he died. Like I had absolutely no emotional connection to that character whatsoever, and um, that's that's different than being in. Enga- that's however we still played that game to the hilt, and um, I still don't have a really good feel for my Knights Black Agents character yet. Uh, their personality wise, but I know, um, like, like I'm, you know, dedicated to, uh, protect the team, blow up vampires. Um, yeah, not, not yeah, I always think, in that I mean, order. Knights, Knights so. Black Agents does a good, has a different way to hook you in the game, right? Knights Black Agents yeah. doesn't, Knights Black Agents doesn't start by hooking you with a character. It hooks you by pulling you into the investigation and then the conspiracy, yeah. right? Like, right. like the, what's happening in with the vampires has been enough fuel to get us over the initial hump, which is why I'm like, cool. After this mission, we should stop and do some character stuff Mm -hmm. because we have it right. Like you guys have just been like mission machine for a while, but like, I'm thinking about our next, our upcoming cortex prime game, a game that, um, I am one. I'm really excited because I want to learn cortex prime. Two, I think this is a really interesting idea because it's a game that literally has no combat in it. Um, it's just going around um, uh, rescuing disasters and helping people out, which I think is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, but I need like the thing I want to make sure is that like we play it hard. Like yeah. we don't leave anything at the table, like no reserve, no like nobody has to invest. You don't have to build a whole deep character background until later. But like that, we just um, like we we grab the rail with both hands, right? Like just really dig in and play it. Yeah. Yep. That's a pep talk I'm going to have when we um, yeah probably Sunday That's night fine. after we get through character creation is to talk about that. Like, what can we do for each other to pump each other up to be excited about playing this game? What can we do in game to keep each other excited? The investment I'm happy to come later the um the engagement what can we do to psych each other up yeah yep and because I feel... we've had a rough we've had a rough run of it oh, right yeah, like absolutely our other sunday game has been very stable right we had a really nice we had a nice long run with forbidden lands for a while we're actually going to probably come back to that game when the new supplement the demon land thing comes out um because mm-hmm. i will definitely i i, I back that one when that one ships we'll probably go back and play um that game again we're having a good run of knights black agents like i'm having a like i'm having a lot of fun making the mysteries and i love how um that game works in engaging you know things Mm -hmm. but our other our other sunday group has had a lot of trouble through the pandemic and a lot of it has been um mental health stuff among the group myself included yep right we've like but we also got to a point where we didn't want to play anything that was like sad yeah, or dark. Right. Which, you know, used to be a good portion of my yeah. game collection. Right. is like sad and dark games used to be a thing. But even now, as we're like starting our junior year of the pandemic, right. Like I'm, you know, I'm just not into sad right now or dark. Like I want to play something happy um that kind of thing yep so that's you know like what do we do to help ourselves with that like we played i hunt which i thought was an exceptionally good game like well executed and did what it was supposed to but like the brutal um the the brutality of capitalism in that game was like a downer and it's supposed to be right like it wasn't the fault of the designer the game is very much upfront about that. Yep. Um, but yeah. when we played it, it just was like, this game is great. This setting's great. I don't want to be sad right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like, no, don't don't play Band of Blades until you're in a better place. I'll tell you. Yeah. That exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. It's Band a great. Of... It's a it's a great game, but man, <laughs> it's tough. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm a little nervous because <clears throat> the game that I want to run after. Um, the game I want to run for the other Sunday group after we're done with Knights Black Agents, and I'm not ready to be done with Knights Black Agents yeah. for a while, but it's Twilight 2000. Yeah. 
I am dead on. I'm ready for Halloween 2000. And that's that. I mean, I think some people will like it because it's it's got a lot of the Forbidden Lands mechanics. But mm-hmm. that game's um, yeah. that game's not going to be cheerful. No. <laughs> like, all right, we slid off topic again, so I'm going to turn this back into Rain the conversation it. corner, and uh, we can we can wax poetic about uh, all the things that we've been doing in the last uh, four weeks while we've been on hiatus. So I will start off. Um, so many things have happened since the last time we were here with you all. Yep. Um, for yep. me, the highlights are um, uh, I watched all of Hawkeye, which was amazing. Um, the Book of Boba Fett dropped, which so far has been really good. Um, Discovery, the current season, is really good. Um, I got to see Spider-Man No Way Home at the theater, which was amazing. And it's kicking ass at the box office. Um, so many good things that I've watched. Um, we've been playing Valheim and having a really good time with it. Um, Jerry and I have been just bouncing off the walls with some of the stuff that uh, that we've been uh, dealing with in that game. Um, and then Phil started talking up No Man's Sky. And I was like, oh, that sounds really good. And I looked at the price tag and I was like, I don't want to pay 60 bucks for it. I'm like, eh, you know, I have no idea what kind of enjoyment I'm going to get out of it or if I'm going to play it a lot or a little or whatever. I'm like, 60, that's a that's a high bar for me for that. And then after hearing more about it and like that, da, 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 I'm like, all right, I'm going to go look just for giggles. I'm going to do a Google search and see who's got pricing on this game that's not 60 bucks. And I'm like, oh. I can go to this website over here that says it's got legit Steam keys for fifteen bucks, fourteen ninety five, and I'm like, all right, for fourteen ninety five, I'll take a shot at this. If it turns out to be a scam site of some kind, fifteen bucks out, I'll bite that, you know, and and and, and lament it later. But it's like totally legit. I got the key, I jumped in, started playing, and I'm like, struggled the first. You know, like hour of figuring out all the controls and how everything works, and I still have trouble flying because I overcompensate, and then I start going all over the place and getting dizzy. But it's a nice game for the creative people, the 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 Minecrafters, the Valheimers. This is, you know, gather resources, survive, build stuff. You know, work your way through the tech tree, you know, good, good times, um, having a ball with it. And then Jerry and I tested out the, uh, the, the co-op play last night and I jumped into his session, uh, and it brought me over with all my stuff and I'm like, okay. Yep. And I got some stuff while I was playing with him. And when I went back to my solo world, like I still got some of that stuff. I'm like, oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so very interesting, very well put together. Um, having a good time with it. Um, just hanging out with friends. As we said, I had people over for the bandits game last weekend for lacrosse, um, box lacrosse for those that know the lingo. Cause it's played indoors in an arena as opposed to field lacrosse that's done outdoors. Um, and this whole thing with, uh, doing game design for our cortex game, we're basically cortex is a toolkit cortex plus cortex prime cortex prime. Um, you basically pick and choose the different rule sets and, and subsystems and stuff that you want. So basically we're designing this game from the ground up to play and it's been fun and I'm definitely excited about it. Looking forward to sitting down at the table with that. Um, very, uh, very cool. And that's just a little bit of everything that's gone on in the last four weeks. I could go on at length, but we have two other hosts that we will now jump to with Jerry continuing. Uh, well, first of all, I had a good time at our holiday friend party. We decided to get together and do kind yes, of a holiday friend party <laughs> yeah, for our holidays. Um, Phil came up with a bright idea that we were each going to uh, buy a Lego set 25 bucks or less and wrap it. Then we would all just each grab one and we'd sit there, we'd eat food and tell stories and build Legos. Um, obviously, this played all into my wheelhouse, so I was all for it um, and had a great time. Um I've been enjoying Valheim a lot. I think Valheim is a lot of fun, especially as a co-op game. Um, The number of times that we've done um, just come up with an idea, 
Uh, Bob went into his – Bob has a solo instance. He went an experiment of building a lodge. Thing. He was like, I want to build a lodge at the side of a mountain. And we spent like two days just harvesting materials and building a giant lodge in the middle of nowhere. Um, we've tried different different things. And, and it's it's a lot of uh, promotional things where we, we help each other. Like uh, Chris gets on like once every week or so. And so obviously he's behind us on equipment. So we'll just go out and – harvest all the resources he needs to keep up with us. And then he'll show up and, all right, go into this chest. There's a bunch of stuff. Build whatever the hell you want. Like, he's really wanted to build a crystal axe, which we've never seen before. So we gathered all the stuff so you can build a crystal axe. Just, it's been a lot of fun. And then watching people do stuff. Um, no Man's Spy, this guy's been good. I'm having a lot of trouble with the controls, but I've never been good at controls. So I don't play jumping games. But I'm enjoying the exploration, and I like the way – the game integrates um, identifying things and figuring out the resources you need and what you can put together and the like. Um, uh, I've been enjoying playing Knights Black Agents. Uh, I like me some Jason Bourne and I like me some vampire movies. I'm really excited about Cortex. Uh, I've played it in the past. I think it's going to be a great, great game system. Um, watching things. I'm still watching Dexter and Yellow Jackets on Showtime. They've both been very good, very dark shows. Um, not very upbeat, but very dark. Uh, no Way Home blew me away. Even going in having a fairly good idea what the plot was going to be, it surprised the hell out of me. And there's just so much feel-good stuff in that story. Uh, I guess it's up to $1.6 or $1.7 billion at the box office right now. Yep. So, um, uh, Of course, Book of Boba has been amazing in filling that Star Wars niche for me. Um, I've even been enjoying, we just finished, uh, the, the first half season of Star Trek Discovery and I really like where they're going with it. Um, and I, I like the fact that we're seeing different stories coming out of Star Trek again that still feel Trekky. And lastly, big, big, big time Lego building. I've been, um, finishing up some big projects and revamping a bunch of stuff. So a lot of times when I'm watching TV or listening to games that I'm sitting in my basement building things and, uh, just completed, three major projects that have been uh, one of them took me like 14 hours to do so um it's just it's, it's replacing what i used to do which was building miniatures to play warhammer um, but uh we've been having a good time just building lego buildings and uh i was telling bob and phil the other night that i was actually in the shower when i suddenly had a re revelation on how to fix a problem i've had for years with one of my sets and my wife came downstairs wondering you know why are you sitting in the basement wearing a towel? I'm like, I got an idea. I want to. So, you know, mm -hmm. I was re-engineering stuff to see if it worked. Now I just had to wait for the pieces to come in. So um, still relaxing, still fun, still chaotic. It's been a good time. It's gotten me through the uh, the the chaos and hecticness and uh, just disturbingness of, of the holiday season. And now that we're past it, I'm, I'm out to the side. And all these things kind of help get me through it, especially our, our holiday friend party. Phil? Yeah, let's see. Um, I did a bunch of stuff over the last four weeks. Um, I binged all of Cobra Kai season four on New Year's Eve with my son. That was excellent. Oh, no. um, thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed Cobra Kai as I have every season since it started. Uh, talked about the Cortex Prime game. I did a lot of cooking. Um, so that's always um, that's always good. I cooked a lot during the holidays. Um, so I had fun doing that. Um, the end of the year or the beginning of the year is where... Um, all of my um, house organization stuff as part of my home care system that I, I created. Um, so I spent a good portion of um, that first weekend reorganizing closets, cleaning out my dresser, um, my reorganizing my pantry, all that stuff. Uh, but it was good. I got it all done. And so like um, everything's reorganized, ready to start the new year. Uh, I got into some home automation Um Thanks to Senda, who got me a HomePod and some smart plugs for Christmas. Um, and I added some smart light bulbs. And so now most of my lights in my house are all automatic. Um, and uh, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I like having Siri as my backup in the house now for things like remembering to put things on my shopping list and things like that. I've got that kind of um, really tweaked out um, and enjoyable. Plus, that HomePod makes a pretty sweet speaker. Um, we had Christmas music going during our party and all that stuff. Uh, I have started reading again, slowly, um, trying to build back some con um, some concentration. 
um, decided to go back to the first book I didn't finish during the pandemic, which was um, Gibson's latest um, release um, agency, which is excellent. Um, I really like of all the Gibson trilogies. Uh, the Sp- the Sprawl trilogy will always be my first favorite. Um, this one, um, this current trilogy that this is book two of, um, is spectacular. This may be some of Gibson's best work since Neuromancer. Um, thoroughly love, thoroughly love this world um, that he's built. And I think we're going to get a chance to see it because I think rumor is the peripheral, which is the first book, is going to be... Um, is optioned as a series for Amazon. I think so. Um, Which means I will be stealing somebody's prime account because I'm going to need to be watching, going to need to be watching, uh, need to be watching that when it eventually releases. Um, The other thing I got to do was I got to do my um, session one um, of uh, my one-on-one thirsty sword lesbian game with Senda this past week. Um, We played, um, we're playing in the setting that we were developing for another game that never took off um, our long live the queen um, time traveling female musketeers, time travelers and female musketeer game uh, that first session went off pretty well, um, starting to get the feel of the rules entered into the first story working pretty well. Um, so that was good as well. Um and uh, I've watched, I haven't watched any of Hawkeye. Um, I just haven't had the time. Don't know when I'm going to have the time to sit and watch it. Um, and um, I did not go see No Way Home. I wasn't quite comfortable enough to go to the theater. I think when it came out was around the same time my parents were out at Christmas time. So I wasn't really comfortable um, going out. Definitely not going to a theater for another couple of weeks. Maybe it'll still be in the theaters. Um, or I don't know, I guess I'll see it some other time is what's going to come down to it. Cause I didn't make the window for it. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much it. That's me. All right. Well, that will bring us to close this thing out with our Patreon shout outs. Thank you so much to JT Evans, Jared Rasher, Jen Pixelscape Skagney, Jim Fitzpatrick, Joseph Peralta, Carl Halperin, Michael Draper, my Brett, not my personal Brett, but someone's my Brett, Ninjabi, and the Rainmaker. And the thanks Rainmaker. to everyone for listening tonight. Yeah, if you're free on Tuesday evenings, 8 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. the Queen's time, you're welcome. Come join us live on Twitch where you can chat with the other listeners in the awesome chat room for life and ask us the occasional question. If you cannot make it to the live show, check out our podcast each week wherever you get your podcasts. And take a look at some of the other shows in the Mr. Mark Network, such as They're a Super Geek, Mastering Dungeons, Bonesaw and Obsidian, The FM Gamers, Panda's Talking Games, The Gnome Cast, Jean Gu Hustle, The Lounge, Bonus Experience, and excellent back episodes of She's a Super Geek. You can and should also check out our sibling podcasts, Tabletop Bellhop, The Knights of the Night, and the always amazing Gaming and BS. Indeed, indeed. Before you get too far into session one, drop us some feedback. You can reach us directly via the old-fashioned email, mmp at misdirectedmark.com. Hit us up on Twitter. The show and the network is at misdirectedmark. He's Robert M. Everson. He's GM Gerrymander. I'm DNA Phil. If you like what we do here and on the other shows in the Misdirected Mark Network, you can support our Patreon campaigns. MMP, Mastering Dungeons, and Pandas Talking Games are at patreon.com slash MMP. Zhengu Hustle is at patreon.com slash Zhengu Hustle. And Bonus Experience is at patreon.com slash bonus experience. Patrons of MMP, Mastering Dungeons, and Pandas Talking Games get access to the after show, pre-production show notes, musical parodies, the Bamboo Lounge, and other special releases. This has been a Mr. Mark production. The media arm of Encoded Designs. Mike Drop. We are...